Um, fantastic. So this session is on um, uh, journalists and computer science collaboration. Um, I think it's part of the reason we have this conference at all, but it's actually really hard to do. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, a few different examples of uh, how that has worked and not worked. And then we're going to have a little uh, discussion about that after a few presentations. Um, joining me are uh, Mark Keane of um, University College of Dublin and Cheryl Phillips of Stanford University. And um, they're each going to present to you sort of concrete examples of work that they've done where collaboration has been uh, largely successful, I think. Although I hope you will uh, admit to the difficulties as well. Um, I'm going to start off with just um, a short talk, just sort of try to frame some of the difficulties that I've encountered in, in trying to do this work over the last uh, seven years or so. Uh, so I want to try to um, get across this idea that there's a, there's a gap. Um, so I call it the, the research to reporting gap. And um, I'm, I'm aiming at a very particular problem, which is very near and dear to me. Um, the problem is basically that there's lots of papers coming out, um, some here, some in other forums, about computer science researchers doing really interesting things with data, right? In natural language processing, in machine learning, visualization, new statistical techniques. Um, almost none of it is being used in reporting. And notice I say reporting, not journalism. Um, so this is uh, one of the seminal papers of computational journalism. Where, where is Jay? Out here somewhere. Anyway, um, it's this idea, right? Stories will emerge from stacks of financial disclosures, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, that no one today has the time or money to mine. So the idea in this passage is that we're going to have all of these tools, and they're going to help us find stories in data sets that uh, we otherwise wouldn't be able to find stories in. So notice this is a vision of using this technology for reporting that is the finding and production of stories. We've seen a lot at this conference and at um, you know, journalism and computation events generally that are about analytics. Like yesterday's keynote was almost entirely about uh, analytics and recommendation engine. This is not what I'm talking about, right? The only thing in that presentation which was on the story side was they're, um, the, uh, they're, they're starting to, to write um, sports stories and stuff. I'm now struck a heliograph, I think it was called. Thank you, yeah. So mostly not. Uh, so the way I think of this is there's sort of a, a space of ways that you can combine computer science and journalism. Um, and on the left there is what we normally see. Um, so when I mention to an NLP researcher that I'm working in journalism, normally the response is, oh, that's great. You know, I analyzed the Reuters corpus. I've been training it to do you know, topic modeling on the last 20 years in the New York Times. Um, that is uh, running these algorithms on the output of journalism as opposed to the input of journalism, which are the raw source documents. Um, so that's the left-right axis. The up-down axis is what, what people could do and what they're actually doing. So for example, topic modeling. I'm aware of only one story where topic modeling was ever used. Uh, and that was only sort of in a peripheral way. And that was the, um, the echo chamber a story um, out, of, out of Reuters uh, two or three years ago. Uh, and I think in part because it's actually that topic modeling isn't quite useful. It, it kind of solves the wrong problems. And so there's this disconnect between what people are actually doing in report, which is mostly search engines. We're starting to get into things like document classifiers and what the research community is working on. Uh, so why do we have this gap, right? Um, I think there's, there's basically th three reasons. One is that computer scientists make some mistakes. One is that journalists make some mistakes. And one is that um, the incentives for different groups of people are really different. This is a picture of an investigative reporter's desk. Um, uh, lots of paper, highlighting passages from a document, making post-it notes for things to uh, look at later. Um, it is, in fact, a real investigative reporter. That's so neat, that desk. Uh, well, you know, they're European, so maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah, you're not seeing the rest of the office here. It's actually a hotel room in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, so what are they doing here, right? 
um, they're obviously going through some sort of process. And when you see accounts in, for example, the um, there's a whole strand of literature that is sort of visualizing document sets, right? Topic modeling or clustering or extracting information or sorting things, a much beloved uh, visualization exercise, right? But, but normally those papers don't make any reference to this. Uh, another disconnect is that um, I don't think researchers generally appreciate how much of a disaster the input data that journalists work with is. They, they sort of imagine that it arrives as you know a CSV or something. More often, <laughs> it, there we go. Right, this is the right crowd for that. Uh, more often, it arrives on paper. In fact, um, in my presentation last year, I, I uh, uh, showed a piece of research where, I, uh, by survey, it arrives on paper about half the time. Right, and not just like a printout of emails. If you're lucky, we're talking like hand annotations and holes punched through it. Um, it doesn't OCR well. It's really a mess. And then the standard algorithms that people tend to use in the computer science literature don't generally work very well on the data that journalists have. So, for example, um, I often tell people that I'm involved in entity recognition um, for investigative reporting. Um, and they're like, oh, do you use Stanford NER? Do you use NLTK? And no, because they don't work. And here's a very simple example of the ways in which they don't work. Um, so this is a, a, a document listing the uh, subsidiaries of a Russian telecommunications company. This was part of an investigation by the Organized Crime and, Coording, uh, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project on a $25 million bribe to the president of Uzbekistan. And, uh, so there's entities, obviously, right? And we have a list of uh, companies. Uh, this is not going to be picked up by most NER algorithms because they're all built around parsing. They're built around finding noun phrases. There's not even sentences here. It's just a list of companies. Um, and it's quoted in the, you know, the LLC comes before the company name and so forth. No problem for a human. Uh, I don't know a single NER library that picked this up. And then there's this weird idea that And then there's this weird idea that um, the point of the algorithm is to find the story that is in the data. The story is not in the data. The, the, the data may contain enough clues to allow the reporter to piece together the story from other elements. Should I go with this one over Go ahead. Okay. Yes? All right. Um, so this is uh, a diagram from uh, a really interesting paper that was written for the um, intelligence community on trying to construct a narrative by looking at a huge set of unstructured documents. And it's this idea that you look for connections between cliques of entities, and each clique is a coincidence of you know people and places and so forth. And so you can kind of see that you know this guy was at a hotel in 2004 at some address and so forth. Um, it's a neat little theory. Um, but as anybody who's done this sort of data intensive work knows, you have to combine this with a, a huge amount of knowledge from other sources, so from your reporting and just uh, common knowledge and domain knowledge from the head. Um, so, this one? Okay. Uh, and then here's another problem. Um, so I'm, I'm laughing at myself here because it would be um, rude to point out other people's work. Um, but a huge number of projects which ostensibly are built to help journalists have a GitHub page which looks something like this, right? Oh, it's easy. You just download this thing and then that thing and then you uh, load all your data into a CSV, which you know, I've highlighted for you there. Um, nobody is ever going to do this. Uh, at this point, the standard is a web app. If I can't go to a website and try out the technique, uh, I'm just not going to. Because I've got good options as a reporter, right? I know that I can solve the problem by reading all of the documents, and I'm prepared to spend the next week doing that. So why would I spend two days trying to get your software running? Meanwhile, there are, direction, there are mistakes in the other directions, right? Um, so these are the reasons why journalists, uh, you know, we're, we're not doing ourselves any favors in terms of making it easier to get new technology uh, used in reporting. Um, so for example, um, Right, this tried and true process, uh, it does work, it is a process, but at the same time, we're not thinking about what we could be doing. So why, you know, 
why aren't we reaching for something better? And the answer is you know, that it takes some work, right? We really have to think about, well, how could this be better? And it takes some investment. And that investment is very hard to do on deadline. Um, maybe I don't even need to explain that one. Um, a number of people in this room have, the, have had the experience of trying to get journalists to uh, upload their documents and data into some sort of collaborative repository. Um, Almost everybody has failed at this. It's very, very hard to get journalists to do anything but hold their files very tightly on their laptops. And in, invest in an investigation, the whole point is to try to combine information from many different data sources to triangulate. Uh, so of course, it defeats the purpose. This is starting to break down a little bit. Um, this was a piece a few years ago um, that claimed that people in blue states watch more porn than people in red states. Um, Jacob Harris did a, uh, then of the New York Times, did a brilliant takedown of this that appeared in uh, Open News Source, which is really worth a read. He just goes through all of the reasons why this conclusion doesn't make any sense. One of which is that um, apparently Kansas has the highest number of porn viewers. Anybody know why it ends up being Kansas? That's right. Kansas is the, is the center of the United States, or at least it's... Um, where you go if, the, um, if you can't uh, resolve the location of the IP address. You go to the geographic center of the US. Right, so that was just one, one of many problems, including um, you know, the correlation causation problem, uh, issues with, with sampling and proxy variables. It, 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 this is really a disaster of a piece of work. And then, you know, it can be very hard to uh, get technology deployed in a newsroom uh, where um, people are having trouble, you know, downloading files and, and um, you know, editing spreadsheets and so forth. And um, I think anybody who's tried to um, support journalists and technical work from time to time um, sort of, you know, closes the, the door behind them so as not to be too rude and, and says things like this. Um, and, and this is more... Um, a comment on the idea that, well, you know, in order for us to get these advanced techniques working in newsrooms, we're going to have to get the simple techniques working first. The third and maybe the most difficult problem is that the incentives for the people involved here uh, are radically different. And um, this is an analysis that uh, is due to Sarah Cohen, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, but she pointed out that there's basically three different types of people involved in um, trying to get more advanced techniques applied in journalism. There's the researchers who are coming up with this stuff, there are the reporters who have to use it, and then there are the software companies who are building this into tools for people to use. And they all have very different goals, right? Uh, a researcher is done uh, when they've published the paper. You know, they might have a GitHub repo that gives you command line instructions for running it, but otherwise they're done. Um, the reporter has no interest, and the newsroom generally has no capacity to write software and support it. Um, Whereas uh, commercial software companies who actually do routinely produce software, uh, they're going to turn towards revenue. And journalism is a terrible market. Uh, I'm hard, pre it's, it's not a very big market. It doesn't have a very much money. Uh, especially for reporting tools, it's very sporadic, right? So there are a couple successful tools um, used for analytics and, uh, and so forth, but uh, it's very hard for people to, to invest in reporting technology. Because uh, there are only about 2,000 full-time investigative reporters in the world. Uh, so as a result, the tools which journalists uh, use successfully have mostly been built for other markets. So think of Chartbeat, right, or Dataminer. Uh, th these exist for journalists um, only because of uh, they're being subsidized by their industries. Um, there's a couple exceptions. Uh, so Reuters Tracer is an internal tool, which is kind of like Dataminer. Uh, and they're a very large news organization. I think the largest in the world by editorial headcount was able to produce an internal tool. Uh, and that's why there exists a tool which ranks tweets by newsworthiness. Um, it's because there was one organization large enough to support it. All right, so everything is terrible. Um, I have a few <laughs> thoughts on sort of where this can go. Um, so this is sort of the rallying cry that uh, I'm, I'm trying to get people behind these days. Um, platforms are not tools. So if you've been following this space, you know that tens of millions of dollars have been poured into tool production and technology production for journalists over the last 10 years by organizations like Knight and so forth. 
um, with a few shining exceptions, such as Document Cloud. Um, basically, all of it is abandoned GitHub repos at this point. Um, there's no interoperability of anything. There's no um, sustainability of any of it. Um, and I think part of the reason is that it's, uh, we have failed is because it's an extraordinarily fragmented ecosystem. Right? We have no app store for journalism technology. Uh, I've tried to deal with this in my own modest ways. So um, as many of you know, I um, built and maintain a thing called Overview, which is a document mining system for investigative journalism. Um, much less known is the fact that it has a plugin API. All of the functionality of it, um, uh, sort of the left-hand side where you get visualizations and so forth, is uh, plugins that can be written in any language. They're just a little um, web server, right? It communicates by HTTP. And so every time a researcher writes a uh, document mining or a machine, you know, machine learning application um, and has their own little UI for document viewing and their own little Elasticsearch in instance and you know, requires uh, journalists to submit their documents as a CSV and builds their own tagging system and all of this stuff, right, I die a little inside because um, that technology is never going to be deployed Whereas maybe if it was an overview plugin, um, it would be because journalists are already using it. Expanding on this strategy, some of you know that I'm shilling for a thing called the Computational Journalism Workbench. Uh, it is a modular system for creating and publishing data journalism. So you stack modules together to get data, to analyze it, to produce visualizations which are then embeddable. Uh, and you can have a link back to um, this original workflow. So think of it like a Jupyter notebook style thing if you come from the data science uh, world, except um, human readable and doesn't require coding. Or if you come from the journalism world, think of it as sort of one step up from a spreadsheet, right? Um, when I manipulate the table on the right, it stacks the operations to the left. Uh, and critically, that little import from GitHub thing in the left there, it's also a package manager for modules for data journalism. So. Um, if you write a scraper, if you write a neat little visualization, uh, you can put it here. So of course, I think my platforms are the best thing ever, but the point I'm trying to make is we have to rally around some platform, um, otherwise we're, we're going to keep rebuilding the same things, we're never going to get this stuff deployed and used in actual work. Finally, I want to talk about sustainability. Um, I want to throw, about, throw out a few radical proposals. Um, the basic problem with doing this stuff as an open source project is that an open source project is not a sustainable piece of software. There's a lot more to it. Um, the basic problem of doing this stuff as a commercial entity is a commercial entity is always going to turn towards revenue. Uh, journalism just isn't a big enough market to attract significant uh, attention or resources or more to the point, revenue. Um, news organizations don't tend to want to do this stuff in-house, although there are um, other possibilities. Uh, or, or some exceptions, rather. Um, researchers don't build production software. So what does that leave us? Well, um, hybrid strategies. So uh, here's one that um, it looks like is going to be the structure we're going to use for the workbench, which is you actually have two entities, a nonprofit, which maintains the open source code base, licenses to a commercial company under separate governance. The idea here is that each of these sides is free to pursue exactly what uh, it needs to, right? So the nonprofit side, uh, mission-driven, you do whatever it is that journalists need. Um, you uh, get grant funds to support journalists' work. On the commercial side, they can do whatever they need to do to make money. They can pivot in whatever direction they have to go. Uh, and they get the benefit of essentially subsidized uh, technology that comes from the nonprofit side. Um, and there are examples of this. So WordPress is the big example of, one, of a company that does this. But we could get even weirder, right? We could take some of that foundation money and find a commercial software company who builds a tool which is almost but not quite right and just give it to them to build out the feature. We could take some of that grant money and just pay for the more expensive commercial platforms which we normally can't afford. Um, as long as there is uh, there are funders willing to try to support journalism, putting money into the space. I think we need to look at funding models which are different from just, hey, let's, let's hire a couple people and build out an open source tool. Uh, because I would propose to you that that model has largely failed to deliver this type of technology into reporters' hands over the last 10 years. All right. Um,
Thank you. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, more optimistic examples of things working. Is this working okay? Good. So uh, I'm going to do a catalog of mistakes, I guess. <laughs> that don't address anything to do with reporting. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Keane. Um, I'm a professor of computer science in University College Dublin, um, but I'm a sort of closet psychologist. So all of my formal education is in psychology, not in computer science. So I usually don't tell people that. But half of my research is in, uh, is in things like creativity in natural language processing, so metaphor and analogy, and most recently uh, on surprise. Uh, but on the uh, AI computer science side, I do things like case-based reasoning and text analytics for the last uh, four or five years. So um, I'm going to talk about the research we've done with the Irish Times over the last about four years, three to four years. Um, this is a project which came out of this uh, very large government investment in this uh, data an analytics center called Insight. It's about a $100 million investment over five years. And part of our mandate was to partner with companies in Ireland and abroad um, to essentially you know, bootstrap them into data analytics uh, solutions as quickly as possible. Um, and in fact, some of our group, uh, Derek Green had worked with Storyful for many years, building tools that were actually used. Um, so we were working with the Irish Times, which um, in the Irish context is uh, a very long-standing and, and uh, much cherished uh, newspaper. And I guess it, as a case, this is somewhat different to what we've seen. We had a very good talk yesterday with uh, the Washington Post. And I guess the sort of counterpoint in this case is, you know, companies like the New York Times, Reuters, Washington Post are absolutely huge companies. Like, most newspapers aren't that. Um, they don't have any budget to do this sort of thing. So by, if you like, leveraging the funding we could uh, provide, it was possible for us to do some R&D with them, if you like, that they couldn't possibly do themselves. So the Irish Times is quite old, um, uh, from 1859 when it was established. They have a good record in digital matters. Um, they were one of the first Turkey uh, newspapers in the world to go digital with a, a, a web-based offering. And interestingly also too, they're not a publicly quoted company, they're a trust, so they operate a bit like a, a charity, so they can be quite independent. And they made a major commitment to us with about 20 editors and journalists to collaborate with us uh, over the course of the project. So the picture in the background here, which you can just about see, is Ireland beating New Zealand in Chicago last year which was equivalent to the, for us, for, to the Cubs situation, because <laughs> it was over 100 years since, since we'd beaten New Zealand. So this is a sort of symbol of success, right? So, so, so what worked? Well, we, we developed about five tools uh, in the course of the project. Uh, um, I guess we could say, in some sense, they worked. Um, it's interesting to look at them. They, a lot of them parallel some of the ones we heard from the, uh, the Washington Post yesterday. Um, we built a headlines tool. We had a tool that did early recommendation for breaking stories and hashtags. And uh, we also had a, a, a tool which created topic-specific websites. Um, so we had a bunch of things like that. Um, we did some good science in it, so we got our publication, so that was OK. Um, and, and I guess the process I think we used worked fairly well. We start with a blank sheet. We sat, we workshopped uh, about 20 or 30 problems from the journalistic side, and then we sort of filtered them down independently. So, you know, the researchers looked at them and said, well, we can't do that within the time limit we have, what we can do is, in fact, one of the main things was the sort of thing you mentioned there. So we had one journalist who said, well, I want this thing that will monitor every company site and government report that's going on, and then it will download them when they're, when they're put up on the site, it will parse them, and then they'll give me the statistics to, to go and build a story. And we just sort of said, yeah, but that's sort of everything. <laughs> so we're not doing that. Um, and so we, we reduced the 20 or 30 problem areas eventually from both sides down to essentially the five things that we built. 
Um, and I suppose we probably killed off some ones which were really big and good in that, but uh, that was essentially what happened. And I guess we could claim uh, that this was successful at the end of the day because uh, the, the newspaper did, in fact, license all of those tools. But I don't think they used them very much, so that's the, the negative bit. So it was partly a defensive licensing that was going on. So uh, the, this is a picture of Ireland after they were beaten by Argentina in the Rugby World Cup. So they don't look pleased in that one. They're not hugging each other they were in the previous one. Um, so, so we were, I think, as researchers, uh, you know, we put a, a really serious effort into not just building the tools, but actually making them almost industry standard in terms of we did, we did stuff on reaction time and stuff like that too. Uh, and I felt at the end of the day that as a group we still weren't close enough essentially to the coalface. We had, we had the early adopter types of journalists who were interested and feeding into what we were doing, but then there was a whole bunch of other people and, and you know, they had a day job and they weren't going to spend really much time trying to use our tools to, 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 to do that job. Um, the other thing which was a real eye-opener to me was the whole evaluation process I think was a disaster. So uh, as a psychologist, you know, I immediately thought, you know, we can run a study and we did this with one or two of the tools. We really tried to simulate exactly what would be going on in the newsroom at the time and it just like, it was awful, right? It was awful because it raised the issue of, you know, the existing technology and could you use the existing technology. It then inevitably became really complicated in the way that psychological studies become very complicated. And it, it confirmed for me something which I felt for about the last 10 years, which is that you should never really try and do cognitive psychology, experimental psychology in these sort of evaluation contexts. Rather, what you need is something really light, um, maybe a simulated experiment, which is what we ended up doing, just having a, a bot actually tweet things to test a particular concept, rather than going into the organization and trying to get them to mimic what, what, what your tool does or test it. So this is what I mean by computational proxies. And I think the final thing, uh, which was, I think, really shocking to me, was the, the, the problems around just the technical integration. So, and, and again, several people have said this, a lot of these companies, you know, they have workflows that are really like bits of string just tied together, you know? So they do this, then they do this, then they do this. We had all this great technology around, you know, using hashtags and tweets, but that was connected into the headline system. As soon as you created the headline, the tweet went out. With the headline, you couldn't put anything on the tweet. So they'd have to retweet it with the hashtag after doing that. Like that just became a fundamental huge block, right? Um, and I guess part of our disappointment too was that the thing which turned out to be the most successful actually turned out to be the thing that was done really, really quickly and was really simple. And you can ask me what that is. <laughs> if you like. I can ask me later what it is. Thank you. Am I supposed to be? Am I, I'm mic'd. Okay, good. Let me get this set up. So my, my partner couldn't be here because of the fires in California. Uh, his flight was canceled, Sherrod Goel. But he's an assistant professor uh, in the School of Engineering. And I teach data journalism. A former, uh, uh, you know, used to work at the Seattle Times as a data journalist and an investigative journalist. So we come from very different worlds. Um, part of something called the Stanford Computational Journalism Lab. And what we try to do is lower the cost of telling uh, accountability public service uh, stories. Uh oh, did I not have it set up right? Oh, sorry. It's right there, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, um, and, and using computational methods to do that. Of course, computational methods, uh, as Jonathan pointed out, can be difficult when you're dealing with um, data that might be messy might be hard to obtain. Um, this is how I get my data most of the time. Um, when I first got to Stanford in 2014, I really wanted to teach my students, my journalism students, how to negotiate for, for stuff like this, how to get it from local governments. So that was my motivation, right? I wanted to teach my students 
how to, how to do that kind of uh, data negotiation, public records negotiation, and then be able to tell a story out of that data. That's my motivation. I also want to be able to tell more advanced stories, stories that I might not have the wherewithal to be able to do myself, stories that might need somebody like a Sherrod Goel. Who, who has done all kinds of work into algorithmic fairness and racial bias and has done academic studies looking at, at stop and frisk in New Jersey. So what happened was um, I started collecting this data and I'd, I had done a story years ago when I was at the Seattle Times looking at stop and search and uh, patterns of, of racial profiling by the Washington State Patrol. So I thought, Hmm, there's lots of state patrols around the country. Let's try to get that data. So I had, I don't remember how many students, uh, maybe 15 or so, and we started negotiating for that data. Uh, we now have uh, 31 states and uh, over 100 million records. So the data negotiation part was successful, although I will say that Louisiana said that they did not collect any stop and search uh, data, including race and gender, because they have a policy against racial profiling, which was interesting. Um, and we had a few, uh, we had a few, uh, well, actually quite a few uh, states who their first responses were, this will cost us $7,000, $8,000, $12,000, $3,000, dollars because you know, we have to go through uh, page by page. Like, no, we're not talking pages, we're talking data. Or we have to build a whole, you know, we, this is a really complicated query. Uh, I just got an email from a student who's working on a, a, a related uh, data negotiation thing. And, and they said, well, you know, they laid out the, the governmental office, it was a city, laid out all of, the, all of the joins that they would have to do from one table to another table and said that this was prohibitive and the bill was something like $6,000. Uh, and I, as far as I could tell, it's really three joints, and that's it. So it's not like a huge, you know, I mean, a, a really difficult problem. It's just that they think that they can tell us as journalists that, that it is and we'll just go away. Um, but we didn't. And I met uh, Sherrod because one of my students actually started looking at uh, a story about um, a local community and whether they were stopping minorities more often uh, just on the local roadways and so she interviewed Sherrod and in the course of the interview she told him oh we you know we have all this data and the next thing you know Sherrod and I met and and he was like you have all this I would really like to use this data I really want to be able to statistically look at uh, this these patterns of racial disparity and see what we can do that might push the field ahead so what's his motivation his motivation is he has a bunch of PhD students they want to look at the statistical measures that analyze uh, racial disparities and discrimination and, and do academic papers out of that. So if we can figure out a way that we can both meet our goals uh, and negotiate that kind of world between journalism and science and academia, then, then we can succeed. And so that's what we tried to do. And let me tell you, we had a lot of conversations about why uh, we had to wait to to clean up the data before we released it because he, they had an academic paper and there was a publishing schedule and, and why we needed to let the journalists tell their own stories. I mean, there were a lot of uh, like, let's understand how each other works kind of conversations, which I think was really useful. So um, we had a project team of PhD students and uh, Vignesh Ramachandran, who's in the audience from our uh, communications department from the computational journalism lab. We had a couple of dozen of my students over, over time. And uh, this is what the data collection looked like, as I think I mentioned. Now we have, uh, we have data on uh, 31 states. We have really detailed data on about 20 of those 31 states. Um, the data came in a lot of different formats. I have stuff in uh, Microsoft Access databases, SQL, uh, SPSS. Uh, Excel and some CSVs, um, but standardizing that data, finding the you know normalizing it so that we can can look at the at common fields took quite a while, and uh, the shared students kind of took the lead in that, which was really great. Uh, my students took the lead in in being that conversate that point that kind of the intermediary between the bureaucrats and the, the data cleaning folks so that we could really understand what was going on. And uh, they also learned how to, how to normalize the data in my classes some. Uh, 
We extracted common fields. Uh, we released all of our data cleaning code so anybody else could take a look at what we did and the choices that we made. Um, and we've also included both our original and standardized values kind of side by side in the data that we've released. Uh, and then we started building tests for discrimination. And so for me, this is a way to like, what stories have been done? Can we, can we give this data to journalists so that they can tell those stories? And can they tell stories that, that haven't been done at all? Can we really take a look at, at, can we use Sherrod's group who are building these new statistical tests and use that for journalism? So we, we, know, we looked at search rates. Black and Hispanic drivers are searched about twice as often as white drivers. Um, but you know, there might be differences in behavior that's not necessarily strong evidence of bias. A lot of times in journalism, you know, the journalists might stop there. They may not have uh, taken classes in really advanced statistical analysis. So be, you know, that may be the level of their comfort. OK, I'm just going to say this. And then, and then the story doesn't do what it could do in terms of impact. So we took a look then at the outcome test, which is where you get hit rates. Are they finding contraband more often on minorities than whites? Um, you know, or, or whites versus minorities. So in this case, uh, a lower hit rate for minorities might indicate I I discrimination, right? Uh, but the, um, the problem with the, with the outcome test is that, well, let me just, actually, I'll start with a little bit more detail. So the hit rate, for example, for Hispanics was lower than for whites and blacks. That's basically what we found kind of overall. But the problem with this is, I think there's a weird echo of my voice. All right. Um, is it that sometimes it can fail to det detect discrimination. And this is something that I don't, I mean, some data journalists would know this, uh, especially if they were really delving deep into the story or talking to a lot of experts. But I really think it took Sherrod's team to be able to, to say, well, what can we do to address this issue? Um, so what do I mean by hit rates can be misleading? If, let's say you have a search policy where it's everybody, uh, the, there's a race neutral policy where there's a likelihood of carrying contraband. If it's, if it's above 10%, you're gonna get searched. That's it. And if whites have either a 1% or 70% likelihood of carrying contraband, and blacks have a 1% or 50% likelihood of carrying contraband, what you end up with is a white hit rate that's 75%, and a black hit rate that is 50%. So it would indicate discrimination against blacks, but it wouldn't be true, right? So that's just kind of, if you think about it in a theoretical world, that's where you can see that there can be times when the hit rate would not accurately represent what's really happening. So how can we, how can we address that? As a data journalist, I'm probably not, I, I, and I've done some fairly complex analysis, but I am not equipped to be able to figure out how to address that. But Sherrod is, and so is his team of PhD students. So that's what they did. They built a whole new test called the threshold test. And basically it kind of uh, looked at the interplay between the search rates and the hit rates. And there, uh, I list the paper there. And they basically found that, that officers had a lower threshold for searching minorities than they do whites. If you look at all of the stops that we have, and over, you know, taking into account all of the various factors that the bar is lower, like, to search minorities. There, and it's on the basis of less evidence. So that was our threshold test, which uh, we've already published some papers on, and uh, kind of, I think, moves, for, for Sherrod, kind of moves the field ahead, right? That was a really great research challenge for him and his students. And it was a really great way for me to also get some journalism done. So uh, collaboration was really important. So I had my data journalism classes. The Pointer Institute has helped us by helping to support some workshops that we've had for journalists. So we've trained over 100 journalists. And we went straight, we, we went straight past spreadsheets. We trained them using R and RStudio. Which was, a, which was a challenge for some of these, these journalists. But uh, we, we did one-on-one -on -one training. We did a, a workshop at the IRE conference, and we did a workshop in Chicago a month ago. And, um, and we're providing kind of support. Like I had a reporter email me his scatter plots two days ago. Hey, does this look right? This is what we're finding for this area. 
Does this make sense? This is what we're going to be reporting on, just as a sounding board. And so now newsrooms across the country are, being, are able to do stories that they would not otherwise necessarily be doing, especially because they don't have the time right now or the wherewithal to go try to negotiate for this data and then to understand what they need to do statistically. The, the engineering students, you know, kind of played their role as I've already described, and then we had an, another kind of third, third leg, and that is the Stanford Library uh, created an open repo a repository for all of this data, so it's permanently archived, and, uh, and, and that was also a really useful thing. So we have created a website where anybody can download the data. We have uh, tutorial, video tutorials. We have other tutorials that you can just kind of walk through. We have all of the README files. Now we're going after city-level data. The University of Maryland has two media law classes, 84 students, and we're going after the top cities in each state. So uh, we're just kind of pressing on. And it's already been used um, quite a bit. And just because it's late in the afternoon, let's see if I can get to where I need to go here. I'm going to give you an example of how it's been used. This is the it's been used in a lot of really good ways in terms of like substantive public policy journalism, but it's also been used by Trevor Noah. So, Researchers at Stanford University collected and analyzed 60 million state patrol stops in 20 states. They found black drivers are issued 20% more tickets than white drivers, and Hispanic drivers receive 30% more tickets than other drivers. Oh, no. Hispanic drivers were most likely to be searched, least likely to have contraband. Wow. Hispanics are the ones getting the most racism? That's, that's like finding out the hotel room next door has even more semen than yours. <laughs> no, I mean, that's part of you is happy, but the other part is like, oh man, I got the nerd room, come on. <laughs> Now, one of the more interesting pieces of information that came from the Stanford study was that in areas where police regularly make broken taillight stops, stops of black and Hispanic people are both about 20% more likely for broken taillights than stops of white people. So if you're a minority who wants to reduce your chances of getting stopped, you've got to make sure your taillight is never out. And if you're thinking, but Trevor, that's impossible, you've clearly never met Leo okay, Depp. and now he goes on to a whole skit, which I'm not going to go into, but it's a fun skit. So uh, we had, we've had uh, a variety of news organizations use the data, NBC News, uh, The Economist, there's, a f there's a several others that are working on the data now. Uh, uh, the, the Marshall Project did something the same day that we released the data, uh, taking a look at the impact uh, of marijuana legalization on search rates, which is also was an, another piece of the, the analysis that we did. But uh, I think that for me, this was kind of a pilot project of what can you do if you find uh, similar goals that can, can kind of lead you down the same path. And I think that you can do this with a lot of, of data sets. A lot of local data can, can, can be gathered and used and, and be made available and is something that would be attractive to academic researchers. So that's kind of, I guess, my pitch for, for why collaboration works. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Joe. Uh, that's very cool to see that, that work progressing from where it was last year. Um, so I'm going to ask um, two questions and then I'm going to uh, open up for your questions. Um, Mark, um, I've, I've read your paper, but for those who uh, in the audience who haven't, can you tell us what the tools were that you built and which ones worked? So, the, the, I didn't mention the one that worked. All right. I'm a bit ashamed of that one. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the one which I think was the academically the most successful was uh, a tool called Hashtagger Plus, which uh, tracks um, hashtags as they appear in a breaking story and then uh, clusters those stories, gives you feedback on what other uh, news providers are doing with those stories and, and how much um, attention they're attract attracting in Twitter during that time. And then it gives you a recommendation for the one you should use for your article. Um, the headlines one uh, was very similar to the Washington Post one but not as sophisticated. It was a really very simple piece of work but it used a classifier to assess shareability of the headline and also checked uh, 
sort of factual aspects of the, the words used in it, were they sort of discriminating with respect to uh, the particular article you were trying to advertise? And we use a very large database of previous articles, like 100 years of previous articles, to, as, a, as a, a knowledge base for that. Uh, the third uh, main one was uh, one called Topi, which was, again, to produce recommendations for uh, topic-specific websites. So, you know, a you know, particular trial is on, you know, this will, will furnish the reporter with all the existing articles on the different aspects of this, uh, and it was built on top of, of uh, the, the previous hashtag. The two ones I didn't mention were, were Cropper and, and uh, uh, Outliner or something like that, I think were the names. They were very simple, but they were the ones that are currently being used. So they just cropped the pictures. The newspaper had two guys working full time, going through hundreds of photographs every day and producing them for the different, they needed a different format for the web-based version versus the mobile version versus the, the published paper. And so this classifier identifies the main entities in, in the picture and then crops it automatically and produces the, the three or four different formats that were required. So immediately apparently that saved them something like, I think it was uh, 50 or 60k every two months or something like that. So why are you ashamed of that success? Right? What's well, because I, I, I think as an academic we, there was no paper from it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Interesting. Yeah, so it just underscores your point about me having very different motivations what we do. So which of those projects do you think was the, did any of them hit the sweet spot for this type of collaboration? Um, in, in, well, in general, uh, uh, not. I mean, I, I think, you know, the ones which we thought were the coolest um, were the ones which turned out to be the least used, you know, and, and what we were blocked by was that technological, you know, the, the integration into their, their workflow, essentially, which turned out to be hugely complicated. In the case of the cropping thing, it took about three or four months to get that into the newsroom or to get it into these guys. Um, they had to go back to the software company who had been buying the software off for 10 years, and of course they had to change and write new APIs for the software. And, like, and it was a really simple, it should have been a simple thing. Like we produced all the tools in a web-based format, so we thought they could be directly used, but they still couldn't be put into the workflow that the journalists were using. So. It's almost like systems integration is a multi-billion dollar industry. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, Cheryl, um, as I'm looking at the stories that came out of it, so I've, I've actually taught um, this work in my, my class, and it's a, a fascinating piece of statistics. I despair trying to explain it yeah, to the That's the hard public. part. The, ex the explanation of the threshold test is difficult um, because it's a really, uh, it's very complex and it's this interplay between uh, the search rate and the, and the hit rate and I don't think we are there yet but I, I believe we will get there in terms of being able to explain it more easily but the, the best that we've come to is, is there's this lower bar that is being used and you, these are the factors that we measure. But yeah, the the scientific explanation is is uh, is something that Sherrod does, and I think he he's tested it on a number of audiences, and people still get a little lost. So we're working on that. Yeah, but that's why it's a good challenge, right? It's a good academic challenge, and it's a good journalistic challenge. So is that um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question? Um, to what extent is it the researcher's job, or let's just go with job, to figure out how to communicate what it is that they did uh, to the general public, which is, of course, a key part of journalism. Yeah. Well, right, that's a very good point. I mean, I think they're explaining it in their papers, which, which is not going to be the audience there, it's not the general public. But one of the motivations uh, is not just to publish the paper, although that's a, that's a pretty big motivation on, on their side. Is, but it's also to have an impact on public policy. If you want to have an impact on public policy, then you want your work to get into the zeitgeist. You want Trevor Noah to pick it up. And then you want to make it uh, more easily understandable. So I think that's why the, the researcher would try to do that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, questions from our audience? All right, I think Jacob, you go. Is there a R package that does that test? 
we're working on, we're building it. Yeah, in the process. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm a statistics PhD student, and I think what you guys are doing is awesome. And I'm wondering, uh, well, first, like, is that sort of a scalable model of, you know, collaboration between, you know, the traditional STEM subjects and journalism? You know, maybe it's undergraduate students, maybe it's graduate students. And also, relatedly, how do you, you know, motivate, say, me or, like, my colleagues in you know, statistics and computer science to, to want to work on these things? And obviously, my our primary, our primary motivation or external motivation incentive is, uh, is papers. Right. And how do you get people to sort of like look beyond that? Well, I mean, I think the paper, you still have to take into account the motivation for papers. And you have to figure out, do you have a research challenge that is hard enough, right, that you can then do a, a good substantive paper <coughs> off of it? And is there, the, then can you think about like, well, what's the journalistic story that could come out of that? And make sure that you're both going toward that end goal. And that's hard. I mean, it's not like it's an easy thing, but there are lots of subjects that lend themselves to that, where there's being research, you know, there's a lot of research being done. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're going ahead and going after the city level data, because the state level data can only get us so far in terms of really measuring whether, what kind of discrimination is happening. And uh, for Sherrod, that's, that's what he likes to focus on. So there's a great research challenge for him. What makes it difficult is, you know, how many, how, I can't, we can't keep relying on the PhD students to be like building the pipeline, because that's, that's just boring. That's not fun work. I mean, and so we've hired an engineer to actually work on building a, a processing pipeline um, using grant money so that we can kind of dispense with that part of it. And I use a little bit at the front end to teach my students, because they need to know it, going into data journalism. I don't know if I answered your question. One more question. Oh, well, well, while you're walking to Meredith, yes, I think it's scalable. I do think it's scalable. Um, I think that a lot of, a lot, one of the things that happens is that local news organizations collect data sets like, like this all the time. And uh, I'm hoping that through the Stanford uh, repository, we can start collecting that and making it available and aggregating it up. And then having researchers use it as well as journalists. Um, this was a terrific panel, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, where uh, researchers typically find funding for these kinds of projects. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can give you a list of the people who have paid me. Um. I mean, the McCormick Foundation is one pointer. Knight Foundation, there's like all the usual kind of suspects. But there's a lot of organizations that, that cover topic, like, you know, they fund topic central things. And so it depends on what the topic is, I think. So what about on the, like, on the researcher side? Like, not on the journalism side? Yeah, I'm not equipped to answer that one. That's why I rely on Sherrod for. But Anne will. Um, one suggestion might be um, contacting the um, affiliate programs at in the computer science departments, because sometimes um, companies will come to the CS departments looking for specific problems, and those new um, places at the Stanford with media companies. So, so I think there's a lot of room, actually, that uh, people um, haven't really thought about this very much, but there's, there's room to play in those spaces. Thank you very much for a very insightful panel.